being here this afternoon. I, uh, I used to preach for the church in Tompkinsville, Kentucky, and the, the church there in Tompkinsville was kind of an older style church building, and the fellowship hall was in the basement, and they had those old floor vents. Y'all know, they, they used to have these, these floor vents, and, and it, they had to run the heat in Kentucky in the wintertime. Every third Sunday, we had our third Sunday night potluck, and I remember I'd always be preaching, and all the food would be set out in the basement, and all those floor vents, when the heat would kick on, and they would fill the auditorium with the smell of food, and you might as well quit preaching uh, whenever that happened. And that's kind of what I feel like today. <laughs> David said, now as soon as he finishes, we can go eat. And, uh, and by the way, when he said he went out to check, did y'all notice that barbecue sauce on David's lapel? Did y'all see that? I, I mean, I was a little bit, I, I, I'm almost positive that's what it was. So the, uh, I know we're going to have a, a great feast, but let's spend a little bit of time in God's Word and let's be challenged in some ways that can challenge us and encourage us. If you have your Bibles, open up to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I want us to start by looking at verse by looking at verse 12. 1 John chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. I'm just going to read part of it. But, but he says, If we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. Isn't that just a, a fascinating concept? The idea that God abides in you and that you abide in Him. I, I, David, I'm really glad you didn't give me a lot of time on this because because as, as I, my mind just keeps wrapping around this idea of what does it mean to abide in someone. And, and it's one of those things where like I know what it means, but, but I just feel like not exhausting the depths of what it means really to abide. And, and just finally, he's, he's talking about this deep, personal, intimate relationship. That, 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 not, a, not a superficial sort of relationship. Not, not just, a, 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 just a, a factual based relationship, but a deep, personal relationship that is impacting in your life. You, you abide with this person. This person abides with you. Jesus in uh, John chapter 15, uh, John, John writes uh, the words of Jesus in, in John, John chapter 15, and there you know what, what he's talking about when he's talking about being the vine and the branches. And he says in John 15 and verse 4, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot, cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. There's something that is by God's design for us to have our lives intricately woven together with the presence of God as He abides in me and I abide in Him. It's a relationship where, where everything from the direction of our life to, to, the, to the, the strength or the dependence of our life, the identity that we have, or even the rest that we find is totally wrapped up in this relationship that we have with Jesus, with the Son of God. When we abide in Christ, it will give us direction in terms of how we live and what we do and what we say. Earlier in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2 and uh, in, in verse 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6, uh, John says, "The one who says he abides in him, he ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked." And so all of a sudden we, we find ourselves as people that when we are reviled, and sometimes you will be reviled in this life, what do we do? We do not revile in return because He did not revile in return. He gives us direction. He gives us, he gives us strength. 
As we understand this, this dependence whenever we're going through the difficulties and the struggles of life. So, so all of a sudden, whenever, whenever the, the, the nations rage, as the psalmist would put it, is that a good, is that a good enough way to, to, to talk about all sorts of stuff that t- tend to bring upheaval into our life? Whenever the nations rage, whenever our lives are turned up on its end, that, that, the, thing, that the thing that we have our hope in, the thing that's going to get us through those things is what? To be still and know that I am God. We abide with Christ and He abides with us. We find our very identity. Who who am I? We live in this world that is struggling to know who am I. We live in this world where where people are are identifying themselves by by their political political affiliation, by their sexual uh, identification, by by their occupation or their career. All of these things that we think think, uh, identify and say who we are. Can I tell you, our identity is in Christ. We have to understand that. I abide in Him and He abides in me. We even find our rest within Christ. What is it that brings us peace? What is it that brings us comfort in the trials of life? As it, it's, it's, not, it's not a few more dollars or another pint of ice cream. or this, this, the, the, I find my rest in Jesus, in being with Him in communing with Him, in reflecting Him. And in this text that we, we look at here in, in 1 John chapter 4, and, and I, I, all I'm trying to do is, is, to, is to lay this groundwork of, of my mind struggling to, to identify what it really means to abide in Christ and Him and us. But in this text, he, he draws a parallel. And he says, there's a connection, there's a connection between Loving your brothers and the very Spirit of God dwelling within you. And it's a connection that you cannot miss. So so if if you will, go back in your text, and I just want us to walk through some of this as we go. All the way back to verse 7, okay? And then we'll we'll get back to verse 12 and verse 13. But all of this this works together. in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7, he says, he says Beloved, lo- let, us, let us love one another. And we, we, we could stop right there and just ask the question. I don't really know anybody from anybody here. But we could just ask the question, do you love your brethren? I, I didn't ask if you tolerated your brethren. I didn't ask if there were a group of people that you met together in the same room with. I, 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 didn't, I didn't even ask, are, are there people that you happen to share uh, theological ideas with? Those are all different questions. What I asked you was this. Do you love your brethren? I met, a, I met a brother last night. Actually, I think I met him last year. But, but he was sitting on the back row. I think his name was Cain. It's one of your members, Cain. And I don't see him today, so y'all tell him I was talking about him, okay? Uh, tell him the preacher called you out and you weren't there. If you want, you, but if you love him, you'll tell him that. But, 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 but when I was talking to him, I loved talking to him because you know what he was talking to me about? He was talking to me about all the widow women here in this congregation. And can I tell you something that, that Jesus was coming across, was screaming from this, from this man in his words and in his face? He loves the widows in this congregation. He cares about them. He's invested in them. And, and I, I, not only do I believe that about him, I believe that they know that he loves them. And, and Jesus says, John says, let us love one another. That's a question we need to be asking as we think about the direction of the church and and as that relates to our our relationship with God. Do we really love one another? I I worry sometimes that that there are Christians, that there are people who have been washed in the blood of the Lord who don't think that it's important for, for, for them to relate to God's other children, to love one another. 
And that may come more natural to some of you than others, but what we're told here, let us love one another. Over, over in the book of Ephesians, I, I think about the way that <clears throat> I think about the way that Paul talks to husbands and wives and, and about, how, about how a husband is supposed to love her wife and a, and a wife is supposed to show respect to her husband. And he uses this language and he says, he says, and you see to it. You need to make sure in your home, gentlemen, that your wife knows she is loved. You, you need to make sure in your home, ladies, that your husband knows that he is respected. Don't just say, that's good, that's God's plan, that's the way it... No, you see to it. That's your job. That's your mission. If you want to be what God wants you to be in your home, you see to it. He's saying the same thing to every one of us. Love one another. How do we do that? How do, how do we show love for one another? I got. I mean, and you can. You can. There's an endless. Um, you, you can Google it for yourself, right? How how do we show love for one another? Well, I don't know. Maybe some things to, to suggest is you know all of a sudden what's important to them is important to you, whether it's really important to you or not. I I, I can remember that this just stands out in my mind. We were at a a fifth grade, a, a, a fifth grade. Um, rec league football championship for my, for my son and I'm standing out there and I'm cheering and I'm hollering and you know the world's going to end if we don't win this game and I'm, I mean it's a big deal to me, right? And all of a sudden, I, I'll never forget, I looked over and there was one of our elders from church. Now, and I, I, I literally, I said, what are you doing here? He didn't, have, he didn't have a kid out there. You know why he was there? He loves me. He loves Mike. And I'm really, I mean, that, that was the message, right? That, that, hap that must have happened almost seven years ago. Still remember it. Somebody cared about me and my kid and my family. That's how you show love. I like to be around them. Man, if we're going to have a get-together, I mean, I'm, I want to be together with God's people. Who is my, who is my mother? Who is my brother? Right? Th th this, is, this is my family. I, I, it's, not a, it's not a burden. I want to be with these people. I pray for them. Do you pray for your brethren? Do you grieve with them? When they hurt, do you hurt? Do you sit there in silence whenever they're struggling? That's what it means to love someone. D do you have a desire to compliment them? You know, when you're in love, don't you just want to tell people all the time, I just love you. Remember you say it, say it to your husband, your wife, maybe your kids. Sometimes just randomly. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just mess with my kids at Free, Free Harbor and I'll just send them a message. I say, I just want you to know I love you. I'm proud of you. Man, I'm really proud of what you're doing. Now, I don't do that with everybody, okay? I do that with my kids. You know why? I love them. Middle of the day, hope your day's going good, babe. Love you. Don't do that with anybody but my wife. Man, I love her. That, that urge to compliment, do, do I? Do I sacrifice for them? You, you, you could add to the list. Maybe it might be a good thing if you want a fellowship during, during, the, during the, the corn roast, right? We can just talk about, hey, how can we show the love that we have in our hearts for our brethren? Spend, spend 30 seconds in between, in between barbecue, right? 30 seconds talking about those spiritual things and see, and see if it's not 10,000 times better even than the food itself. Because he says, let us love one another. Well, well, why is this such a big deal? Well, love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Remember back in John 17, Jesus is praying He's, he's preparing his disciples, and, and he's, he's having the, the, this, what's like the real Lord's Prayer, this whole chapter where Jesus is talking to the Father. And he prays in John 17 and verse 24. He says, he says to his Father, I have declared to them your name and, and, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. What I want to see in the church that I'm about to die to a step, I want them to have the same love that you and I have together. 
And if you want to know what, what, what that looks like, try to explain the Trinity. Try to explain the and And, and what, what you're going to find is you're going to have a really hard time distinguishing them. Love I want them to have for each other. I want the same love that we have to be in them and I in them. Jesus said it like this in John 13, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Question, when you hear that statement, now you know I just read the words of Jesus from the Bible, right? By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Does that statement fill you with peace or does that statement make you want to add something to it? Y'all preachers in the room, you better be honest, okay? And I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm reading that and I'm thinking, okay, I mean, identifying marks of the church and Christianity and how people are going to know that we're standing for the Lord. And we got abortion. We got instrumental music. We got uh, marriage, divorce, remarriage. We got the, the role, uh, the role of, of baptism. I mean, those are things that don't matter. They don't matter. They don't mean anything if I don't have love. Now, is there truth about every one of those things? Shake your head up and down. There's truth about every one of those things. There is a right way to think about every one of those things as, as it's revealed in God's Word. That's that truth we talked about on Thursday night, right? But, but to understand that you could be right on all of those things, and I hope that you are, but you could be right about all of those things, and if you don't love your brethren, you are not recognizable as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Too many times I worry that, that there are people who are right and wrong at the same time. They've got all of their theology mapped out, but, the, but they don't love their brethren. And Jesus says that's how people are going to know. Here's, here's this idealistic statement that I think we need, need to embrace as a church. Where I'm, I'm going to be real honest that, that I think we've got, we've got some people that, that you know, that they're like, that they want to be, I want to be a, I want to be a, um, uh, a grace church, or I want to be a truth church. The Bible says Jesus came full of grace and truth. It's, it, it's not a balancing act. It's not, well, we got a little too much grace over there, a little too much truth over there. No, all of grace is to bear. All of truth is to bear. That we, we as a people, it is possible for us to, to, to represent the truths of God's Word at the very same time that we show the love of God in everything that we do. They are not mutually exclusive ideas and quit believing the lies that it is. Quit believing the lies that if you preach the truth, you can't be loving and that if you're loving, you can't preach the truth. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you that Jesus says this is going to start this is going to start by you learning to love one another. But we, we struggle because we don't even know what love is. Don't we struggle with this in our world, in our, in our religious world, even to identify what love is? Our culture, our religious culture. We, we, we have people that say, say well, the reason, the reason that you don't embrace homosexuality is because you don't really love people. You can Google the videos. That's what they say. And people say, yeah, that's just unloving. No, it's not unloving at all. Matter of fact, it is love. It is love to obey the commandments of God. We, 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 see, we see people will come in in, a, in, a, in a, maybe a relationship sort of situation, and we, and we want to make this point. Love is a verb, right? Husband comes in, he says, I, I mean, I, 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 wish I, I wish I couldn't count all the times that... that that I'd had to deal with this, but a husband comes in and they've been married to his wife for several years and, and he, says, he says, well, I, I just don't love her anymore. Just don't love her anymore. Love is a feeling, feeling like you never have that anymore. And, and, and you, you look at that person and says, your problem is you need to go home and love your wife because love's a verb. Love's not just a feeling that, that you get. Love is something, love is something that, that you do. John 14 and verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. 
Didn't you like that in Brother Denton there in John 14? I circled it in my Bible. It's not just once, four times. He says, you're going to keep my commandments. Love says, got some young people. Where'd our young people go? Our teenagers. They, they, went, they, they, went, they got closer to the meal. That's what they, okay. That's what, I, hey, encourage, encourage those teenagers, right? But I like to ask them, you know, I mean, you, you talk about the love chapter of the Bible. Some of these boys don't even know what the love chapter of the Bible is. That's why they don't have a girlfriend. But, but, but when, you look at, when you look at 1 Corinthians 13 and what he says about love, we know this. Love, what does it do? It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Your problem is you need to be going home and loving your husband, loving your wife. Love is a verb. Yeah, but love is not just a verb. I worry, I worry that sometimes we have this idea that love, love is this thing that you do whether you want to do it or not because it's the right thing to do. Well, there may be an element of that, but, but ladies, if your husband said the only reason he hadn't had an affair on you is because, is because well, that, that's against the covenant and he, and he can't do it and you'd be mad about it, so, I mean, that's the only reason. Would you like that? No. My wife wouldn't like that. I wouldn't like it either, Right? Why? I wanted to say, I, I wouldn't do that because I love them. Love is a verb, but love is also a feeling. It's, it's okay to have a feeling, isn't it? It's more than a verb. I, I, that, that, that may sound kind of, kind of silly to us, but, but to understand, I'll say that they're in the love chapter of the Bible, and he talks about some people who did some amazing things. He, he, says, he says there, you could give all of your possessions to feed the poor. Anybody ever seen anybody do that? I've seen some sacrificial givers, okay? I've seen some amazing... When you guys do your mission Sunday here, that's pretty awesome, right? I mean, somebody is being sacrificial and giving, I mean, giving a lot. That's really awesome, okay? But have you ever seen anybody give it all? The widow's might? Maybe you... I've never once in my life seen it. It would be awesome, right? If somebody just said, here's every dime that I have in the whole wide world, I'm going to give it all. To the glory of God. Or he says, you, you could give your body to be burned. And I've seen people suffer for the cause. Never saw that. I know it's happened in the history of the world. I've never seen it. He says you could do those amazing things. But if you do not have love, it profits you nothing. Love is a verb. Love is a feeling. All of these things are coming together. And, and he says, that's, I, I want, there's a way I want you to treat your brethren, and there's a way I want you to feel about your brethren. Let us love one another. Why? Because love is of God. Because he says, God is love. God is love. We, we are striving to be godly people. We are striving to be what, what God calls us to be. Now understand, God is not just loving. We, we, sometimes we, we think about God the same way that we think about ourselves. Um, we, we might say, um, um, Trace, you don't know this, but in our, in our earlier class we talked about what a good husband David was, okay? And nobody objected, so we just went with it. It was two of us in there. But, but we, were, we were talking about this, and, and listen, we, we, we might say David is a, a very loving husband, okay? Women sat in the church, so I don't say anything about Okay, but that's, just, that's a joke my head came to, right? But, but this understanding, he's a loving husband. And what we're saying is there, there's like this, this thing called love, these, these characteristics, and we're judging him based upon these characteristics to find out whether he's loving or unloving, Right? That's, that's not God. Love is not out there, and we're trying to figure out, okay, is God loving or is God not loving? That's where people come up and they talk about God, and they say, well, well, I, I just couldn't believe in a God who you fill in the blank, okay? That what they're doing is they're trying to take some, some idea they have, and they're judging God based upon that. God is not loving. God is love. He is the very definition of love. Whatever he does, that's what love is. We understand that? If you want to see love, listen, and David's uncomfortable. He said, don't look at me. Don't look at me. He says, look at God. God is love. I'm just trying to reflect who he is. God is the very definition of love. For in this, in this, let me show you what this looks like, okay? And there's lots of examples we could give about God, but, but the greatest example in this, 
In this, the love of God was manifested towards us. That God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation. There it is again, right? To be the propitiation for our sins. When I say God is love, you say, well, that's big talk. Well, let me show you what it looks like. And there's no greater example than Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. So when we think about loving our brethren because God is love and we're trying to look like God, we're not talking about a I'll scratch your back and you scratch my back sort of situation going on here. That, that's easy. Are, are there some people that are easy to love? Are there, in, the, in, in this congregation, are there some people that are easy to love? I know that there are, right? Are there some people that are a little bit harder to love? Don't answer that. I already know the answer to it. I mean, I'm, we, got, we got people at Forest Park, and they're my brethren, but I'm just going to tell you, they make it a challenge sometimes, okay? They're, 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 see that laughter? I mean, that's, I don't know who, who was laughing, but I, I know, you know, right? This, when God says that He sent His only begotten Son because He loved us so much, listen, that's a bold statement of love. It's not a situation where, where God looked down and He saw a bunch of good people like you and me and He just decided to send His Son because we deserved it, if anybody ever deserved it, and we're so much better because He sent Him. That's not the gospel. The gospel, is, the gospel is that he looked at you and me who were a bunch of wretches who deserved to go to hell for all of eternity and then he sent his son. That's the gospel. Can, can, can you go with me just like a, a deep dive for, for just a minute? I don't, I don't want to go too deep and I don't want to spend too, too much time there. But just, just for a second, would you think about all of the reasons that you ought to be lost and go to hell? Think about it. Don't say it out loud. I just want you to think about it. Things you've done, things you've said, things you haven't done, things you haven't said. That's not a pleasant thought, is it? But unless you're lying to yourself, every one of us is sitting here thinking of Things that, well, things that if everybody else knew we were thinking about, we'd crawl under the pew. It's necessary because too many people don't understand the love and the grace of Jesus Christ because they don't understand how lost they are. You've got to understand your desperation. Too many people don't know how good the good news is because they have no idea how bad the bad news is. I, I want us to dive deep into our own sin because it's from the depths of our sin that we become overwhelmed with the, fact, with the fact that there is a God who loves us in spite of us. It's in the depth of our sin when we've given Him every reason to say, why in the world would I even care about these people that He says, I love them so much I'll send my Son. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's God's amazing grace. That's the gospel. That's, that's the good news that we have to constantly come back to. I'll, I'll start it. You finish it. Okay? Uh, for all have sinned. Good. Keep going. Keep going being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the gospel, guys. We memorize the bad news and we, and we, and we, and we neglect the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God is only a statement that's being given in order to tell us about how wonderful our salvation found in Jesus Christ, who He presented as that propitiation again, right? So that God might be both just and the justifier. And you read Romans 3 and, yeah, condemn the world, but condemn the world so, so that we can get to the salvation of the world. That's love. That's the love of God. So when I say God is love, th th this, is, this is not quaint 
easy. This is astounding. How are you doing loving your brethren who are not easy to love? How are, how are we doing at loving our brethren who can't do anything for us? Because that's the example that we're given. Beloved, beloved, he says in verse 11, if God so loved us, and he did, right? I mean, if, if this is the case, if, 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 you're not over, if you're not overwhelmed by that, if, if it's not making you tingle a little bit, then I got a question if you're really understanding it. Because this never gets old, okay? If God so loved the world, we also ought to love one another. So all of a sudden, my relationship with my brethren, it's not based on what they deserve. It's based on what I've received. It's the same thing. You can make the same argument about, about the forgiveness that we show to one another, but he's making the argument based upon the love that we have for one another. It ought to humble us. It ought to inspire us. When my flesh ought to say, I don't have any time for that person. No, if, if God had time for me, I have time for that person. It ought to inspire us. If God did this for me, I'm going to show that. The truth is, he says, no one has seen God at any time. We like, we like to take these verses and just like pick them up out of there and we just like make the statement, no one has seen God. Any, okay, but understand what, what he's trying to say when he says no one has seen God at any time. And then he says, if we love one another... God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. You want to see God? Moses was there on Mount Sinai, and he said, Lord, I want to see you. I mean, it was kind of crazy because I thought he was seeing God there. But I want, I want to see you even more. And God says, you, you, can't, you can't see me. And he hides him in the cleft of the rock, and he passes by him in, in that situation. You, you want to see God? No one's ever seen God. If you want to see God, you look at one brother loving another brother. If we love one another, God abides in us. You will see God when you look at His children and the way that they love one another. And love, His love, is being perfected, completed, worked out in our lives. For by this, by this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. He says the fact that you love one another is evidence that His Spirit dwells within us. Now, a lot of times, it, you, you, once again, people take this verse and they, and they pull it out and, and we, we get into a conversation about, about the, the indwelling of the Spirit, which he talks about here. But, but don't do that. Don't do that without an understanding that as he's talking about the indwelling of the Spirit of God, he's only doing so, he's only doing so in, in an attempt to illustrate or, or to talk about how we love like God that connection between the fact that the Spirit of God dwells within us and we are a people who love one another. He does the same thing like in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, right? For your body is the, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? And, and he's, yes, he's, there is a theological point to be made there, but the point he's making is because your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, you ought to be fleeing fornication. You ought to be running away from sin because you would never do those things in the temple. But you are doing those things in the temple. See the connection? He's talking about the, the indwelling of the Spirit because he's trying to say, that ought to move us, motivate us, be proof, be a challenge to us. So many words I want to describe there, right? That we ought to love one another. And so when God's people come together and they act like they can't stand one another, that happens in, in churches that claim to belong to Christ. They got a real problem. They got a real problem. And I'm not saying this is easy, right? This wasn't easy for the disciples. This wasn't easy for, for I think, even for Jesus in, in these relationships. But, but this is the challenge for us to say, I want to look like God. I want to show God to the world. How can I do that? I can do that by loving my brethren. We have seen that relationship. He says, we've seen it in the form of the Father who sent His Son. 
So whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, and there's a ton to say about all these verses, right? But y'all want to eat, and so do I. But, 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 but to understand, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. We love one another because God is love and because God has shown us love. This is who we are. This is not a compartmentalized part of our life. Well, I guess i got to go over here. And I, no, no, no. This is who I am everywhere I go because God abides in me and I abide in God. We abide in Him, and He abides in us. They are challenging words. Because I, I listen to these words, and, and I, think about, I think about how I can be unloving. And, and I think about times that maybe I've neglected or judged, or, or I just haven't shown the love that I, I wish I had. And in those moments, there's this challenge to say, I, I want to do better. I, I want to do better at being God's representative in this world. I, 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 I want to I I reflect His image. I, I don't want to reflect my image. I'm going to tell you, my image is very selfish. Okay? Like, that's, that's, that's flesh. The world, the world doesn't need any more Wes Hazel. The world needs Jesus Christ. He's the Savior. He's the example. The world needs, the world needs God. He's the one that shows us a way. And so there's this challenge, but there's also this, this encouragement and this inspiration to be a people that love one another. And when I love, one, when I love my brethren, I was in lessons the other night, he said, he said they were out at dinner and there were all, all of these different uh, backgrounds and racial makeup and all these things, and somebody said, I got to know. Didn't you love that? He said, I got to know, who are you people? He said, we're the family of God. Man, I wrote that down in my Bible. I love that. That's who we are. Because the world's not like this. The world's not like this. And if you haven't been kicked in the teeth by it to figure it out, don't, don't worry, it's coming. The world cares about itself. We're a group of people that say, no, no, we, we care about our God. We love one another because our God is love. And it's in that moment, it's in that moment that you have the opportunities to really share life together, to abide with one another, to walk with one another, to be what God intended the church to be, and one day go to heaven together to be with our God. That's our Mission, that's our goal, that is our dream and our focus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear God, Lord, we thank you for everything in our life. Most of all, we thank you for your, your son Jesus. We thank you for the example that he gave. Lord, we thank you for the example that you gave us in the very sending of him. And Lord, help us, help us as a, as a people, help us as your people, to reflect your image by showing your love to a world that is surprised by love. May, we, may they see it each day when they see your children. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen.